Hey everyone, my name is David Hallets and I'd like to talk to you about what the cloud actually is. I'm gonna decloudify you what it is. This talk is intended for beginners, but when I gave it for the first time, it started a super long discussion with senior sysadmin, so it might be interesting for others as well. So I prepared uh, this first slide for different circumstances. Obviously, I couldn't make it to Pristina, so the updated version would be something like this. Uh, I hope you all are doing safe and healthy during these challenging times. So this is me. As I said, the name is David. I'm a senior software engineer working for a company called Red Hat on a project called Manage IQ, which is an open source management platform for managing your hybrid cloud environment and much more. I've been working on this project in the last six years, so I guess I know a little bit about what is the cloud. But even if uh, you would know what it is, it's a far better question, why is it called like that? When you depend on resources, but you actually don't care because you don't have to care about their management or maintenance. As you don't care, you don't even uh, know so you can say it's cloudy for you, or at least it can be if you want this. So now that you know, your life is complete, but I guess you want to know more, so let's dig in. Uh, I'm going to enlighten you with a bulb. To operate it, we need electricity. And if we want to uh, create it on our own, there are a few options. You can pedal a bicycle with a generator or buy a diesel generator, uh, but both of these require too much effort compared to, uh, with the outcome. You need to put too much work into the, to the actual light to shine. This is why we have power plants that create energy that's being shared among multiple users using a power grid. And when it gets to your home, you have an electrometer and you pay for the amount of electricity you only used. And the cloud is basically that we can do the same with computing. Imagine uh, instead of power plants, uh, data centers big enough to serve thousands or millions of users. Uh, and instead of a grid, imagine a global infrastructure that makes these data centers accessible, let's say the internet and you could be charged based on how much of these resources you actually used. So cloud is a utility similar to electricity, water or heating. This is what I would say as the high level definition, but we can dig deeper and ask how is it all done? And the easy answer is you shouldn't care because it's in the cloud, but I guess you're here because you do. So let's formalize what a cloud service should provide. It should uh, provide you theoretically an unlimited amount of resources grouped and redistributed as you wish. Uh, the users of this cloud shouldn't care. How is it done? It should support scaling up and down seamlessly. Uh, it should give you redundancy if something fails. Backups should be available without you even knowing about it. And it should have a pay-as-you-go model per hour, per gigabyte, or whatever you're using. And for that, you need some kind of metrics to measure how much uh, resource you actually used. And you need to somehow access these resources, usually using well-documented APIs and software development kits, which expose you a high level of automation. So. In the following sections, I'm going to prove that most of these technologies were existing a long time ago. So let's start with storage. In Unix, everything's, almost everything is a file. Accessing devices as they would be files, basically that's the Unix philosophy. When you write into a file, uh, it can write to a device. Like if your disk is a file, if you write to the, uh, the disks, File, the file representing the disk, you actually write to the device. Reading is the opposite. You can mount this uh, disk uh, drive to the directory tree of your file system. 
and uh, then you can access its contents. The file system driver does the hard work. It abstracts away everything so you can mount it and then, then access the data inside. And you can also do the opposite because drives all files. Why can it be files drives? So we can create a file and format as a, as a drive, mount the file as it would be an actual physical drive, and, and do the same stuff with the file system driver. And these files can be shared among the network, exposed to multiple computers. So basically, we just invented virtual storage. I'm going to show you in a terminal how is it done. So we're going to, this is a Linux a Fedora machine, and we're going to create a file that only contains zero. So DD is disk dump. We are using the input file dev zero to create a file called my drive. Let's say with a block size one megabyte, 128 times. So it will be a 128 max uh, big file only containing zero. So it will be empty. If I actually hex dump it, so you can see my drive is just containing zeros. It's totally empty. So now we're going to format this file to FAT32. It's fast because it's tiny. And we can create a folder, let's say drive content, or this is in the example. You will see it on the slides. If you check it later, I'm going to name it test. So I created a new folder called test and we're going to mount this my drive into the test folder and now if you look at the test it will be empty because the disk is empty as well but the disk is actually mounted to that drive to that folder and if I let's say do hello world this echo command just prints hello world oh my okay sorry so if I forward this hello world into the test folder into a hello.txt file, then it of course creates this file in the test folder. And let's synchronize the buffers. And if I do read now the contents of the hex dump of my drive, if you look at it, this is now a bootable disk, please insert blah, blah, blah. This is for the fat. Here are the list of files in some weird structure. And here is the content of this file. So it actually got mapped into that other file, which is a disk image. And you can, you can do this with bigger files and basically virtualized storage like this. The other aspect is networking. So you have in Linux a kernel module called tong slash tap. It's basically a virtual network interface similar to the disk drives, but instead of a physical drive, uh, you have a network interface. So when you write to the tong tap file, it actually gets converted to packets. And when you read, then you're actually reading packets from the virtual network interface. On one side, it reacts as a the file on the other side it's it's a network interface so you can route it you can connect it to your regular network uh, the most common use case of this is vpn so when you use vpn except of wireguard which is a new cool thing that doesn't use uh, tontap but its own magic uh, so except of wireguard usually vpns are implemented using tontap so open vpn for sure uh, but it also can be used for software-defined networking. So software-defined networking is a programmable network. As after the, you have access to the data, a raw data from a virtual network interface, you can implement network devices as code. So instead of buying a new switch, buying a new router, you can actually write code. So you don't actually physically have to go there and switch uh, devices, plug-in cables, or anything like that. You have an interconnected data center, and all your network can be defined in software. 
it's really good if you want to do dynamic changes like scaling up a new computer and adding it to a new network you don't have, to have actually to be there physically another aspect which is a little bit longer is computing so when you run a service somewhere you need a physical machine this physical machine runs an operating system and the operating system runs your app it can be more apps but let's simplify it what if uh, you run out of resources you need to you need to buy a new physical machine install the operating system and deploy the app and uh, this is okay if you ju just do it twice but it can be really heavy if you imagine that you have to do it a million times uh, also, when you buy the hardware, you might not need it all the time, so it's a waste of resources. So to understand how can be this solved, let's first ask the question, what is a computer? And here is an artistic uh, explanation of a Turing machine, which is a mathematical model of a computer. You have a tape of memory with instructions, a head that's able to move, move read and write on this tape, and some kind of logic that moves the tape based on the instructions read by the head and also does some kind of stuff based on the instruction. So uh, the sneak peek of this tape can be the code uh, that the machine understand. For example, like this. When a computer is reading these instructions, it goes line by line through them very similarly to a Turing machine. Your programming code is translated to these kind of instructions. And there is a piece of electronics in your computer that actually understands these instructions. But it's also possible to uh, write a program instead of electronics that also understands it. I mean, you can just parse it with a parser and execute the same instructions. Uh, when you compile this program, it will be uh, become machine code. So you'll end up with a virtual machine that simulates the run of a physical one. Why is this good? <laughs> it's easier to manage virtual machines because you don't actually need to touch physical hardware. Like provisioning or retiring, if you want to boot up a new machine, you just do a few clicks and it creates it for you. Migration, if you want to move from Europe to Asia, a machine, you can just copy it through the network instead of actually physically moving it. Or like cloning the disk and sending it. That, that's kind of problematic. Same with cloning. If you want an exact copy of the machine, you can just control C and control V and you can do snapshots. So anytime you can pause the machine, create a snapshot of the memory of the disk and restart it or like retire back to an older version. Also, it provides you an isolated environment because the operating system inside the VM doesn't know it runs inside the VM. It thinks that it's a physical machine and it doesn't have access to the other VMs running on your same computer. Also, it's it's nice for dynamic resource allocation. If you need more disk memory or CPU, you can just add it while runtime. You don't sometimes you don't even have to turn your computer off or restart it. Your virtual machine, I mean. So with virtual machines, our diagram looks a little bit different. So there is a physical machine and an operating system maintained by a service provider and from that service provider, you buy a VM. On that VM, you install your operating system and deploy your app. And if you need more of these uh, apps, you can just buy more VMs. And you don't have to care about how many physical machines are underlying. That's the service provided by the cloud provider. So you can just provision, keep provisioning stuff and the cloud sorts it out for you. Basically, there is this red line. Anything below is managed by your service provider. Anything above is your responsibility. Of course, this can be still heavy. Having a whole virtual machine is sometimes too much. If you just run something small or microservices, you don't really need it. Also, you don't always need that kind of strict isolation. Booting up a system takes time. I mean, all the booting sequence stuff. Uh, there are also useless operating ser system services you don't need and you still have to manage the operating system and the virtual machine like installing packages security fixes kernel updates so what the secondary the second operating system is giving us over the first uh, one that's managed by someone else 
well, not much. So the solution for this are containers, which are small isolated environments running inside an operating system that can be managed by someone else, meaning the operating system can be managed by someone else. To understand them, you should first know uh, where did they come from. So there is a Unix tool, Unix command called crude, ch root, which allows you to change your root directory for a given program. So as an example, uh, let's create a folder in our environment. Let's call it test slash bin. Uh, we should copy a binary into that bin, the busybox, which is a, it's usually on routers that does everything for you. Terminal, uh, shell, uh, SSH server, a lot of stuff. We, we're just going to use it on basic features and we copy it to the test such bin we just created. I check what's the current directory, it's basically the root. And if I run the ch root into the test folder we just created, in that folder we run the busybox command, in the busybox a shell, we enter that confined environment and if you look, the parent directory is it's still root, but we are in a different a current directory is still root. If I run ls, it's not found. Uh, the only thing I can find here is the bin folder with the busybox command. And we can send to that busybox command anything. So we can like map what's in the, uh, the confined environment. So let's look what's there. So there is a hello.txt we created in the previous example, a bin folder and a busy box. And let's create something else. Hi from root. Let's move this to the same file, the hello.txt. I cannot exit this environment without exiting the program. So anything running from this has no access to the outside world. So if I exit, now I'm in a different shell you can see. And if I check the hello the, the text, it has the high from root. So we created a file. And if I go back, I can show it to you graphically. So this was our file system before. There is a, a bin busy box, there is an etsy, there is a root folder, and we created a test folder. In that test folder, we created a bin folder and we copied the busy box from the uh, one bin to the other. And we created uh, a confined environment like this. Our program couldn't get up outside this red marking. And here we created a file, let's call it hello. Uh, containers are built on top of these. It's a confined environment, very similar to uh, this example I just showed. It can be privileged or unprivileged. You can use it, run it as a user. Uh, it has a disk image file. If you noticed, I was using the same image file we created in the previous example. That image file usually contains your stuff plus the dependencies. And you can build these uh, images from existing base images and container registries. You can push yours uh, up there as well. Uh, you can write the finishing files that create those container the images for you. It also provides your virtual network interface so you can access ex external networks and expose services to the host machine or to the internet. Uh, of course, running just single containers isn't really a solution for the problem. So there is a thing called Kubernetes, which is a container orchestration platform that runs containers on multiple machines. It basically handles a pool of machines as one big thing that can run containers, but uh, it doesn't directly run containers, but something called pods, which are smallest units uh, that define a service. It can be containers, uh, some storage to it, some network settings, other settings, and basically all the everything in a pod starts and stops at the same time. And these can be grouped as services. It's highly scalable replication and load balancing and networking and everything is sorted out by you. And the only thing you care about is your container, your app. So 
This is a simple architecture. You have a physical machine operating system, a VM, another OS, and on the operating system, Kubernetes runs. And you just write your app and deploy it to Kubernetes. And when you need more, you just upscale it. And when you add more and more and more, your, uh, the Kubernetes actually sorts out provisioning and running all the other instances. So the line where you don't have to care about stuff is much higher. The only thing you need to develop is your application. Of course, you can say this is not enough. We can go even deeper, and it's true. There is a thing called serverless, which I would say more like serverless in quotation marks, because it really needs a server. Those are basically just isolated function calls. So instead of a whole application, you just write tiny functions. And those functions can be invoked by triggers out from the outside where like HTTP requests, timers, other, other uh, functions. As I said, it actually needs a server, but you don't care about it. Uh, it gets created for you. And then it's, uh, after your function is called, it gets killed and you pay per function call. So if there are no function calls, you don't pay anything. And the pricing is usually used memory times the time it was running. And it, if your architecture of your code base is great, it can scale really well. But of course, for that, you need asynchronous programming, and that's not always possible. An example of a serverless function is here. In JavaScript, I think I took it from the AWS Lambda page. So let's say we have a webhook set on GitHub that opens a URL whenever a pull request is merged. And this service basically sends you an email to a predefined email address that your PR got merged. This is basically called function as a service. And you could ask, if can, could we go deeper? But uh, I don't think it's possible. I mean, I mean, the lower could be like uh, instruction as a service, but a single instruction isn't really doing anything. So what did I miss? I think I missed a lot. This was just an introduction, but I have a few things for you to take home. The cloud is kind of complicated. Uh, it's not magical. It's using already existing services uh, going back to the 80s. It's not evil if it's not used by evil people. Uh, it's just a collection of services named somehow differently to create a hype around it. And it has layers like onions. And the cloud can be also useful. It, it can be completely open source. And depending on if you're developing or debugging or running it, it can be your best friend or your worst enemy. As it has layers, you don't really have to cry, uh, care about the lower layers on only the top where you write your application, but you can look inside it as Shrek looks into the onion. Uh, so the idea is to provide stuff as, as a service managed by your vendor instead of you, while you can focus more on your app. Basically a service as a service or a hype as a service. And I was David at your service. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. So you say the cloud is not evil, but I think this sense is always about control. So how, how, how do we ensure that we have that privacy and that control? Well, hello everyone. Thanks for watching my talk, first of all. So, uh, you're saying that cloud providers might be evil. And you are absolutely right. It's possible. But as the cloud is building on open source technologies, no one and nothing blocks you to build your own and write your own for your friends, for yourself, for your community. I think Redon was talking about it already, that they are doing something similar. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I guess at the end of the day, you have to do it yourself and kind of keep control, right? Well, you have every tool available to do it for yourself. Yeah. 
Um, so this was a, a great overview and uh, where, I mean, how do you see things moving into the future? What could we see, you know, it seems like it's going to the micro scale now and how further deep can it go perhaps? Well, not everything can be converted to microservices and, uh, and uh, these asynchronous stuff. There are huge computation heavy tasks, especially in the scientific uh, area where you, you are not capable of converting anything to a more optimized version. But uh, definitely uh, a lot of services can move to this architecture and optimize their processes a lot. And this microscaling also has an overhead, right? So it seems like it's not worth it unless, again, you're operating at a huge scale. Well, uh, imagine that you're operating a, a movie theater, a cinema, and you have a static website running, let's say, on GitHub pages where it's for free. And you run on a free tier somewhere with a cloud provider. Uh, you only have one API endpoint for selling tickets. And whenever you sell tickets, you pay a little bit of share for your cloud provider, but nothing more because it's implemented as a function and service. So it's sometimes even worth for tiny businesses. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um, all right, I don't see any questions from the audience unless somebody wants to add something uh, in the very last minute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Again, we were uh, sorry that we didn't have you in Pristina as well. And I uh, hope to have you at another time with uh, always interesting topics. Um, the next session is uh, called Open Source in Africa, and it's about, Sh uh, it's from, sorry, Shedrach Akintayo. So uh, stick around and let's uh, watch the next session. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye. Bye.